Uh, good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, depending on when and from where you're joining us. Uh, I'm Dr. John Iskander. It's my pleasure to welcome you to CDC Public Health Grand Rounds for August 2018. Uh, we have an exciting uh, session, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Public Health Grand Rounds has continuing education available for physicians, nurses, pharmacists, veterinarians, health educators, and others. Please see our website or the CDC Continuing Education website for more details. Uh, Grand Rounds is available on all of your favorite web and social media sites. Uh, please send questions to grandrounds at cdc.gov, and we'll try to include your question during our Q&A portion of today's session. Want to know more? We have a featured video segment on YouTube and our website called Beyond the Data, which is posted after the session. This month's segments feature my interviews with Mickey Duran and Dr. Heidi Blank. We've also partnered with the CDC Public Health Library to feature scientific articles about this session. Uh, the full listing is available on the CDC Library website. Uh, here's a preview of upcoming Grand Rounds topics. Please join us live or on the web at your convenience. Uh, in addition to today's outstanding panel of speakers, I'd like to acknowledge the important contributions of the individuals listed here. Thank you all very much. I'd now, it's now my pleasure to introduce CDC's Principal Deputy Director, Dr. Ann Shuckett. Well, welcome to our speakers and welcome to all of you in the room and on the web um, to today's Public Health Grand Rounds. Today we're focusing on strategies to get children to eat better and move more in order to prevent obesity. Today, one in five children in America have obesity. Even more people are on the road to poor health with one in four young adults too heavy to be eligible for the military and two in five adults with obesity. Obesity increases a child's risk for acute physical and psychological health concerns, including early signs of type two diabetes, asthma, sleep apnea, fatty liver, as well as having lower self-esteem and being at greater risk for bullying. The percentage of children and teens affected by obesity has more than tripled since the 1970s. Obesity disproportionately affects certain populations, including Hispanics, non-Hispanic black children, and children from lower income families. It's a complex problem. But today, we'll mainly focus on opportunities for prevention. Early in life, when kids are in early care and education environments, what some of us used to call childcare, today you'll hear about prevention efforts from the perspectives of the federal, state, and child care professionals. Childhood obesity continues to be a serious problem, but with community leaders and partners supporting efforts across multiple settings, it's possible to create healthy environments for children and families across the U.S. to reverse these trends. So I look forward to our presenters and to a, a hearty discussion. Thanks. Our first presenter is Captain Heidi Blank. Good afternoon. Today I'm going to be speaking about a condition that is impacting all of our communities, childhood obesity. In public health, we use a measure called body mass index, or BMI, to assess weight status in both children and adults. BMI is a calculation of weight divided by height squared, and it's a valid and inexpensive screening measure of weight status. And a high BMI correlates with high adiposity. However, it's not a diagnostic measure, and children who do screen positive for obesity should be brought to a healthcare provider for further growth and health risk assessment. To determine if a child has obesity, a child's age-specific BMI is plotted against a sex-specific reference standard created decades ago from children of the same age to determine the child's percentile. The picture on the right shows an image of an example CDC growth chart for girls. Having a 95th or greater percentile on the CDC growth chart indicates having obesity. 
whereas a healthy weight is documented as having a BMI for age percentile between the 5th and 85th percentile. The box in the middle shows an example. A 10-year-old girl who is 4 foot 5 and has 100 pounds has a BMI of a 25. Using the CDC Child and Teen BMI calculator or plotting this BMI on the CDC growth charts shows that she has a percentile that is 97th, placing her above the 95th, and therefore she screens positive for obesity. According to CDC's National Health Nutrition and Examination Survey, or NHANES, since the year 2000, there have been small increases in the prevalence of obesity among preschool, early school age, and teenage children. According to our latest national data, on average, this is 18.5% of children aged 2 to 19 having obesity. That's about 14 million youth across our country, or nearly one in five of our children. So today, we'll take a little bit of time to talk about the steps we need to take together to bend all of these curves downward. As Dr. Shuckett mentioned, there are disparities in childhood obesity. Factors include, but are not limited to, the child's race ethnicity and household income. These slides show sex-specific data from 1999 to 2014 and plot three household income brackets using the federal poverty level, which in 2014 was about $24,000 for a family of four. On the left, we can see that for female girls living in lower-income households have almost double the prevalence of childhood obesity compared to living in houses with higher income and that a similar disparity by poverty level also exists for boys. And as I travel across the US and talk to parents, I've realized that many think that their children are gonna grow out of it, that this is just a phase, but our data shows that obesity is not a phase. Compared to children with healthy weight, kids who are overweight in kindergarten are four times more likely to have obesity by eighth grade with risk continuing into adulthood. Additionally, a recent modeling study shows that if current trends continue, that by 2050, the majority of today's children, or 57.3%, will have obesity by age 35, very early adulthood. These type of trajectory models and the data that we're seeing reinforce the need for greater immediate efforts in childhood obesity prevention. When I was in graduate school, right over here at Emory, um, we were just starting to learn about adipocytes, or fat cells. The image on the right shows a human fat cell. Scientists used to think that adipose tissue or body fat served only as energy storage, but research shows us that the adipose cells are metabolically active. They have found that the amount, distribution, and secretory function determine the impact of obesity on body functions. Prolonged excess adiposity causes inflammation and accumulation of fat within muscles and organs that can inhibit their function. An example of distribution is abdominal obesity. We also call this belly fat or visceral fat. And visceral fat has been shown to release cytokines. These are proteins normally associated with the immune system and immune response. And they can put one at increased risk for heart disease and type 2 diabetes. Excess weight also impacts the body structurally by increasing wear and tear or causing physical obstructions, similar to what we see with arthritis and sleep apnea. Therefore, children with obesity face increased health problems in the short and long term from having greater adiposity. These, again, range from chronic disease risk to mental health concerns, including bullying by their peers and bias from adults in their lives. In addition, because obesity does track into adulthood, children have a higher burden of chronic disease, including hypertension, cardiovascular disease, fatty liver, arthritis, and certain cancers. We used to call type 2 diabetes adult onset diabetes, but that's not the case anymore, as young children are presenting with insulin resistance and early indications of diabetes. Obesity prevention not only results in better physical and mental health outcomes, but has broader school, work, and societal benefits. You will hear more about these today from the speakers who are engaged with children and adolescents in our communities. There is no single or simple solution to the obesity epidemic. As a complex problem, we have a number of factors that impact growth and weight gain. Research shows that early weight gain as an infant, that is the during the first two years of life, is a predictor of childhood obesity. Protective factors for early weight gain include breastfeeding, later introduction of first foods, not feeding to calm or soothe, but feeding the baby based on hunger cues, not topping off or feeding to finish the bottle, which overrides the children's own hunger and satiety cues. In adults and children, we also know that other protective factors include a healthy diet pattern, getting regular physical activity, limiting sanitary time, such as screens, getting optimal sleep, and managing stress through appropriate coping skills and resilience behaviors. These data graphics show that a large majority of US children do not get recommended amounts of healthy foods like daily vegetables, nor are they getting adequate daily physical activity. 
Specifically, fewer than one in 10 children eat recommended daily amounts of vegetables, and less than three in 10 high school students get at least an hour of physical activity daily. In addition to foods like fruits and vegetables that are recommended by the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, unfortunately, there are also some types of foods and beverages that children consume too much of each day. The NCHS National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey shows data from 2011 to 2014 here, indicating that almost two-thirds of boys and girls consume at least one sugary beverage on any given day. Boys consume an average of 164 calories a day from sugary beverages, which is about 10 teaspoons of sugar, and girls consume an average of about 121 calories from sugary beverages, or about seven teaspoons of sugar. The data presented in the slide, also by race ethnicity, shows that non-Hispanic Asian boys and girls consume the least calories daily from sugar-sweetened beverages compared with the other racial ethnic groups. As noted before, obesity is a complex problem, but we have an opportunity for all of us to wear the many hats that we think about on what influences behavior. So we know individual habits and behaviors are influenced by our family, by our caregivers, by our peers, organizations, and our communities. Therefore, there are opportunities through interventions at several levels. In addition to supporting parents and caregivers, ensuring that organizations such as Early Care and Education, or ECE, schools and healthcare are implementing obesity best practices is very important for the early years. In addition, supporting communities to have convenient, affordable, healthy food options and safe places for physical activity. For the rest of the presentation, I will dive deeper into the ECE, or Early Care and Education setting. At least 11 million children under the age of six spend time in childcare, and on average, they spend 30 hours weekly. More than 60% of our toddlers aged three to five attend childcare weekly. Therefore, this setting has an impact on supporting breastfeeding duration among working moms, directly influencing what children eat and drink, their levels of activity, as well as development of critical motor skills and milestone development. In addition, research also shows it's an important place for improving school readiness and early literacy. Obesity costs the United States healthcare system an estimated $147 billion a year. However, there is some good news. Systematic reviews find that interventions in the ECE setting can improve health behaviors and modestly reduce individual BMI. Research is also emerging on cost-effective interventions for childhood obesity in the ECE setting. Included here are findings from a Harvard Prevention Research Model, which assessed the cost-effectiveness of a popular evidence-based childcare intervention that we call NAPSAC, the Nutrition and Physical Activity Self-Assessment for Child Care. The NAPSAC intervention allows facility directors to assess and plan changes to their nutrition and physical activity offerings. And the findings show that if localities and states across the U.S. had centers use this intervention, it could reach 3.8 million children in childcare facilities, which would have less screen time, more physical activity, and consume fewer sugary drinks. Over 10 years, these efforts would result in decreases in BMI and a net healthcare cost savings of $372 million. The Caring for Our Children report pictured on the right side of the slide contains the National Health and Safety Performance Standards for the ECE setting. This is a key resource developed by CDC partners, including the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Public Health Association. The document contains hundreds of key standards, but about 47 for obesity prevention for the setting. It sets forth guidelines to help providers support optimal infant feeding, more nutritious meal snacks and beverages, including water, and more opportunities for children to be physically active, as well as standards to limit time spent in sedentary activities. The CDC, through our partners and the work we do here, utilizes key public health functions to support efforts to prevent childhood obesity. These include public health surveillance, training and technical assistance, as well as peer-to-peer -peer networking, development of translation tools and resources, and funding of states and communities to implement obesity prevention best practices. The resources pictured here are available on our CDC website. This includes a quick start action guide for state ECE systems, a program briefing document showing how CDC and partner Nemours no supports both states and providers, and a CDC indicator report on data for how well all states are doing on supporting obesity prevention in their ECE systems. I welcome you to disseminate these to key stakeholders that you're aware of, and thank you for your attention today. It's my pleasure to introduce Krista Scott from Child Care Aware, who'll talk more about the ECE setting. Thank you all so much for having me today. I so appreciate the recognition of early care and education as a place to adopt healthy weight policies and practices. The ECE setting is one of the best places to, places to reach young children with obesity prevention efforts because we know so many children are in care every day. 
There are several different types or settings of care for early care and education, and I want to explain them because they're all a little bit different. First are child care centers. They're typically corporate-owned or privately-owned centers where you'll have classrooms of children that are grouped by age. Family child care homes are typically small groups with one to sometimes two caregivers of mixed age groups that are, again, in home locations. Head Start programs, which are center-based or home visiting programs, as well as publicly funded preschool and pre-kindergarten programs. Again, those are usually in institutions and there are classrooms of like-age children grouped together. Many children are in those child care centers or formal institutions, most actually. But there are more home-based or family child care providers in number than there are in centers. So there's work to do in engaging both centers and family child care providers in this work. That's really, that's really critical to note because there's a huge difference in who and what is um, happening in those settings. Family child care providers are small business owners. They're small operations with one person doing the work of many. So it's really critical that we tailor supports and services accordingly when we're trying to work with that population. It's also important to remember that these centers and family child care homes are where children are learning and playing and growing are not labs. They reflect the communities around them, the people who work in them, and the families that attend them. Our approach has to recognize that. Lastly, how family ch families choose which setting they will place their children is based primarily on availability and cost. Those factors are heavily dependent on the community's resources. As Dr. Blank mentioned, there are disparities in, ch uh, in childhood obesity by poverty levels. The federal legislation that has the largest impact for low-income children in accessing high-quality care is the Child Care Development Block Grant, or CCDBG, which authorizes funds to states for child care subsidies for low-income children and families. That act is also known as CCDF, or the Child Care Development Fund, which I'll refer to later. CCDBG, or CCDF, has state-level requirements that states must meet in order to receive funds, including rules for licensure, inspection of child care programs within states, and it also requires a certain amount of federal and state dollars be spent on developing quality child care. The recent legislation has created a national set of minimum standards, particularly around health and safety, that states are working hard to meet. In addition to 10 mandated requirements, states were invited to set requirements for nutrition and physical activity. And while I stress that they were invited to, not required to, I do want to highlight that that's critically different. This is the first time nutrition and physical activity has been mentioned in the federal law. It's also important to note that many states struggle to meet these requirements, the regulatory requirements, as well as the optional, and they need guidance and support. Let me explain why it can be so complicated. Early care and education settings are subject to federal, state, and local requirements. Federal programs and requirements in the largest ring include CCDF, authorized by CCDBG, as well as the Child and Adult Food Care Program, a USDA-funded program which provides meal requirements and funding for child care settings that serve low-income children. There are also federal Head Start rules. The federal Head Start program is separate from state programs and has its own set of rules and regulations. States have a network of regulatory and programmatic requirements as well. Based on the rules from CCDF, they develop their state licensing regulations and monitoring systems that are required for most care settings. States also promulgate early learning and development guidelines, which are a set of expectations, guidelines, or developmental milestones that describe what children from birth to kindergarten should know and be able to do at each developmental stage. A final example is state quality rating and improvement systems, which are often voluntary ways to demonstrate a program meets advanced requirements of quality care past basic regulatory requirements. At the local level, providers themselves navigate technical assistance or training opportunities and must meet local public health ordinances like building safety and fire codes. As we've shown, the early care and education workforce has a number of requirements that they have to meet. And we must consider, when we think about policy or practice change, how to support providers. Early care and education staff are low-paid professionals. The average birth to three teachers makes $9.30 an hour. Preschool teachers, for three to five-year-olds, earn $11.90 an hour. Few have advanced degrees. Few have formal training in nutrition and physical activity. And it's important to note, even those with early care and education advanced degrees may or may not have had instruction in, in child nutrition or physical activity. 
Therefore, additional supports are needed to support knowledge and practices around obesity prevention in the early care and education settings. I'm excited to say, though, Child Care Aware of America and our state and local resource and referral agencies are there at every level to provide supports to providers as well as the state so that all children can access affordable, but more importantly, healthy child care settings. In an effort to support states in crafting state CCDF plans that meet the unique needs of their children and communities, Child Care Aware of America has crafted sample language for state plans that reflect best practices and policies for health and wellness in child care. It's intended to inform and educate and provide a jumping off point for discussion, and the sample language illustrates ways that state systems can support development of a child care system that's linked to other systems of, and supports. It encourages healthy eating and active living and ensures that parents, providers, and communities, all three, have the information they need to help children learn how to make healthy choices. In addition, our research and governmental affairs team at the organization helps share data, inform what's working, share what's challenging for states, and help identify state capacity issues. We are technical assistance providers for the Voices for Healthy Kids campaigns that help connect public health agencies and advocates with child care agencies and advocates so that they can incorporate healthy weight best practices into state regulations and state systems. We're doing technical assistance work with our partners in Kentucky to develop key messages to encourage increased funding and resources to sustain their 5210 program, which is designed to significantly reduce childhood obesity. The campaign is designed to give parents, healthcare professionals, and child care providers a memorable way to talk about the key evidence-based behaviors that reduce childhood obesity, eating five or more servings of fruit and vegetables a day, limiting screen time to no more than two hours a day, being physically active at least one hour a day, and drinking zero sugary sweetened beverages. In California, our partners at the YMCA of San Diego County have been running a voluntary recognition program around healthy eating and physical activity. While they have anecdotal evidence of high adoption rates and best practices in their initial pilot group, we're working with them to develop an ongoing program evaluation so we can continue to demonstrate their success. I want to share with you a map we did as part of a partnership we are doing in Alabama. Our core team was interested in food access for children in family child care settings, particularly for low-income children. The team wanted to see if farmer's markets were a potential strategy to increase food access for fresh foods for young children in those settings. So we looked to see if child care providers had access to farmer's markets. You can see on this map there are 53 licensed family child care providers in red and 22 farmer's markets in green. The yellow areas are urban areas indicated as low-income food deserts. There are many family child care providers located in those low-income food deserts, but only a few farmers markets in those areas, which means that the solution is going to have to be deeper than just saying to go, go, you need to go to your farmers market. Our partners now have the data they need to shape the partnership and exploration of farmers markets as a healthy food access solution for family child care. Our work continues in Alabama, and we're supporting the next phase of their work together. Alabama Partnership for Children convened a diverse statewide coalition around ECE, farm to ECE. To more effectively work, move this work forward, we are working with them to help them understand the barriers, facilitators, and resources that ECE providers, farmers, and food hubs face around farm to ECE practices. We're supporting their strategic planning process through developing a moderator's guide for their focus groups around the state, and we're also helping them analyze, clean, and, um, and, develop, uh, and develop their strategic plan. Adding to the success we are seeing in local communities on improving nutrition and physical activity is recent data released from the CDC and USDA from low-income children in the WIC program. WIC is a federal program that promotes healthy eating and nutrition education for infants and children up to five and low-income women who are pregnant, postpartum, or breastfeeding. The data shows that among two to four-year-olds who participate in WIC programs, there have been slight but sustained decreases in obesity rates since 2010. This progress has been seen in multiple racial and ethnic groups of children, which is great because it means we're having an impact on health disparities, potentially. Data like this from the CDC helps partners stay motivated and energized that our work is making a difference. We at Child Care Aware of America are aware of the research and believe strongly that our work is in line with the possible factors for these improvements, which may include the update of federal nutrition programs like WIC, investments in state and local communities, promotion of access to healthy foods and physical activity, and frankly, the tremendous mo momentum in the past decade by state and national stakeholders in supporting ECEs in early childhood obesity prevention. 
We have resources on our website to share the work that providers across the country are doing and to show how systems support healthy active living. We have provider spotlights, as indicated in the picture on the left, that will show how a child care center and two family child care providers in Baltimore City create healthy child care environments for children through active play and good nutrition. We also have an interactive map that shows which states and localities have voluntary recognition programs, like our partners in San Diego, on physical activity, breastfeeding support, and healthy eating. In summary, early childhood is a highly influential setting in which healthy habits can be shaped for millions of children. While workers in these settings have obstacles to overcome, groups like Child Care Aware of America provide a variety of types of support to state and local partners to help them provide healthier foods and greater levels of physical activity for children in their care. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Sarah Sliva. Thanks, Krista. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to share with you some of the work we're doing with CDC Healthy Schools. So because most children are there for a large part of the week, schools are another strategic setting for obesity prevention. We know that about 95% of all school-aged children are enrolled in schools and spend, on average, almost seven hours a day there, five days a week. And many stay on school grounds afterwards for after-school programs and enrichment activities. And this broad reach is critical, given the high prevalence of childhood obesity and existing disparities. And schools are a natural setting to both learn about and practice health behaviors. Heidi talked about some of the long-term benefits of being physically active and eating a healthful diet. But we know that physical activity and nutrition also have important short-term impacts on growth and development that help students make the most of their learning environments. So for example, we know students who are more physically active, they tend to have better attendance cognitive ability, classroom behavior, and higher grades. We know school meal programs help reduce food insecurity and increase intakes of key nutrients. And this is important given that both are associated with students' ability to focus as well as their attendance and grades. Most of us here approach childhood obesity through a health lens, which makes sense. But in schools, students' readiness to learn is a top priority. So this whole school, whole community, whole child framework, it illustrates how a child's emotional, physical, and academic development requires multiple components, including physical education and physical activity, and the nutritional environment and services. Schools and teams working with schools can apply this model to guide their approach to preventing obesity and to supporting students with obesity. We see the community wrapping around the model in yellow, and that reinforces the idea that schools are a part of the community, which in turn influences children's well-being. And addressing these areas can help children achieve and maintain a healthy weight and attitude about weight. So what does the evidence say? Looking at systematic reviews and meta-analyses, including those completed by the CDC, the National Academies of Sciences, as well as the National Institutes of Health, the U.S. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, there's been a lot of work in this area, but there's some consistency in pointing to the effectiveness of a multi-component, comprehensive approach on student weight status. So looking across multiple studies that aim to reduce overweight and obesity among school-aged youth, we see that the evidence is strongest when schools adopted strategies that influenced more than one aspect of what was happening during the school day and then went beyond the school day to engage families and connect with the community at large. So that is, these reviews and meta-analytic studies reported a high strength of evidence for approaches that combined both diet and physical activity and then reached out to have a parent engagement and community component. And we also see that interventions that only address physical activity but still had the home and community component, those are also appear to be effective. So our CDC school health guidelines, they present an evidence-based approach to promoting physical activity and healthy eating in schools with a focus on changes to the school environment and policy. And through the translation materials we develop and the funding we disperse to states and to partner organizations, we work to support schools and groups that work with schools in adopting strategies to increase children's opportunities to move more and eat well while they're on school grounds. And that's before, during, and after school. The strategies that we recommend in our guidelines are implemented as a primary prevention strategy using a universal approach. The vision is that for youth, having opportunities to move more, to eat healthful foods, that's just what it means to be in school. And this enhanced environment can benefit all students, given that most children in the US are falling short of recommendations for physical activity and diet quality. 
Although this universal approach may especially benefit students at higher risk for obesity, youth aren't aware of these strategies as obesity prevention. The messaging doesn't focus at all on obesity, appearances, or weight. It's about changes to school settings to better support health behaviors. And to avoid embarrassing or shaming students, it's really important that schools don't emphasize physical appearances or reinforce negative stereotypes about obesity. Lastly, we know some schools are choosing to implement school-based BMI measurement programs, and this comes up a lot in the news. Um, and in several states and districts, we know that school nurses and other trained staff are conducting BMI screenings and communicating information about individual students' weight status with families. So as an agency, CDC, we neither recommend for or against this practice because we, there's insufficient evidence. But what we do instead is our school health guidelines provide a series of safeguards and practices that schools should make sure they have in place before they launch any kind of height or weight measurement program. And these safeguards are designed to reduce the potential for harm. So for example, our safeguards recommend that in those schools that have a screening program, school health services staff should provide referrals to community-based providers for students whose BMI may put them at risk. And our guidelines are, we're in the process of updating them now. It's going to be a long process, but we're really excited about it. I've been talking about policy, environmental, and systems changes, and I thought I'd give a couple of examples of what that means in the school context. Policy shifts can be adopted at the national, state, district, or school level, and this could be something like requiring the recommended minutes of physical education. And when adopted, the hope is that policies then influence physical and social environments. Environmental supports in a school setting could be something as simple as having a clean, well-maintained water fountain to support students' access to drinking water throughout the school day, or having a well-maintained playground to help support safe play and physical activity. Systems, so having a school wellness team that meets regularly and addresses physical activity and nutrition is an, an example of a school-level system. And that picture comes from our CDC Virtual Schools online resource. As I mentioned earlier, decades of research look at and show strong associations between physical activity and nutrition and academic achievement. But we're still looking to strengthen the evidence base to highlight additional benefits of these comprehensive interventions. We know resources are tight, so the potential to make progress on two outcomes through one activity can help gain buy-in from administrators and school staff. So we're really looking to identify more win-wins. So one area is um, looking to see what are the social emotional learning opportunities available in recess. Another is understanding how physical activity and nutrition programs are associated with students' connectedness to school. We look as scientists to research and evaluations that are happening in schools and districts to inform our approach. But we know that in science, information is often incomplete and evolving. So I'd like to point out a couple of key areas where additional information could help us with expanding the um, reach and maintenance of some of our strategies. And these are some of the questions that we're looking to answer as we work on our guidelines update. So first, just as an intervention can have more than one benefit, there's always a risk that a well-intentioned approach can ha cause harm by another outcome. And with multi-component interventions, we're really interested in making sure that we understand any unintended consequences that may arise. So do modifications that increase students' opportunities to be physically active and programs that shift the nutrition environments, is there a potential for them to be increasing the risk for eating disorders, of weight stigmatization, of students overexerting themselves in ways that could be harmful or dangerous? Knowing more about such unintended consequences would help researchers and practitioners to better develop and deliver comprehensive programs and interventions. Scientists also know less about the effectiveness of school-based approaches for preventing obesity among teenagers. And identifying effective strategies at the high school level is important for several reasons. We know that the prevalence of obesity in 12 to 19 year olds has continued to increase over time. And we have reason to believe that school environments are less protective at higher grade levels. School meals participation is lowest at the high school level, and school nutrition standards are more flexible and permissive at the high school level as well. PE is offered less frequently at higher grade levels, and there's a lot of competing interests and concerns for high school students, and yet at this time, PE and nutrition remain really important. The studies that have, we've used to identify the benefits of multi-component interventions have been limited in their ability to assess follow-up. Most of them are measured over the course of a single school year. And so for this reason, we know a lot less about how long the observed results last. And we also know little about how long those programs last. So that means we have unanswered questions about the long-term benefits of multi-component interventions and strategies for their sustainability. 
So we're really interested in learning more about the long-term impacts, but also what does it take in terms of resources to initiate these efforts and initiatives, you know, in terms of training, leadership, materials, funding, and what does it take to sustain them over time? And these questions are really important to answer and to answer well, because if it appears that only well-resourced districts are the ones who are able to implement multi-component strategies, then there's a potential for widening disparities. And so here, implementation research and practice-based evidence is really useful. So in our work, we regularly look to emerging research to inform our approach and to identify practices that have the potential to be scaled up. And we also learn a lot by listening to leaders who are there working with schools to take the kind of multi-component approach I just described and make it a day-to-day -day reality. So it's, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Mickey Duran, who will share some of her insights from working with the Appleton School District in Wisconsin. Thank you, Sarah. To effectively partner with schools, it's important to highlight the potential benefit to children's readiness to learn and broader well-being, the health and academics connection, and present local data to help make the case. As the slide indicates, the difference between public health outcomes and the Wisconsin State Report Card for schools, there does not seem to be much correlation or connection. CDC data and resources help to establish the linkages and provide a platform to create sustainable change. School administrators and staff know our students are at risk of major health consequences if something is not done to change the trajectory that we are on. Yet schools still treat health like most Americans. Who has time to focus on health? If you talk with any school administrator and ask them about their top priorities in their school, health outcomes will be way down on the list or not mentioned at all. After all, schools are held responsible for meeting and exceeding educational goals. Schools need to understand why it's important to focus on health and how it benefits them in their classrooms and districts. I explain the consequences of child obesity and in particular the rise of type 2 diabetes in our schools and the academic impact to them. Students who are overweight or obese often do not feel good, including experiencing higher rates of depression. I then ask what it was like for adults to go to work and not feel their very best physically or mentally. The universal answer is that they're not very productive and do not want to be at work. When teachers and administrators realize that they have students in their district or in their classrooms who regularly do not feel well, it resonates with them. This slide represents the connection between health behaviors, particularly physical activity, and indicators of academic achievement. An understanding that we have created in our district is the rainbow brain, which is an active fit brain. The images displayed represent functional MRI scans of students' brains. The one on the left is after 20 minutes of sedentary seated time. The image on the right is after 20 minutes of moderate and intensity walking, indicating that the areas of the brain responsible for memory and time on task are more fired up or engaged. We use this data in Appleton to inform our practices. The physical activity needed to attain a rainbow brain provides a reasons for creating active classrooms and directly links to both indicators of academic achievement and reduced disruption behaviors in class. Teaching our students about their brains also builds their capacity to practice self-care through active classrooms and mindfulness practices. Appleton received grant funding to bolster best practices and health outcomes and to address risk factors within the health curriculum. A major goal is to increase activity time for students during the school day. Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction, in partnership with the university, conducted assessments that quantify sedentary behavior. In addition to Appleton, a suburban school district, the study included an urban, rural school districts in Wisconsin. In pilot schools, accelerometers used by students at elementary, middle school, and high school were used to track their daily activity for one week in the fall and one week in the spring. Data was collected on in-school strategies, including active PE, active recess, open gym, and active classrooms. Before and after school activities and family community activity daily minutes totals included weekends were collected in a student survey. For elementary students, recess accounts for about half of the estimated daily in-school physical activity minutes, which means cutting recess would take away the best source of activity. Before and after school minutes, including school sports, are the largest source of estimated physical activity time for middle and high schools, followed by physical education. The biggest takeaway is that no school level is meeting the goal of 60 minutes per day. School can use this data to not only see where they have strengths, but also identify opportunities to implement other school strategies. When we presented this data in our, to our administrators, it was impactful, but more connections were needed to be made. With the evidence to support our work, we developed a physical activity program to support students' health and learning. The state of Wisconsin requires students in elementary to have physical education 90 minutes per week, 60 minutes by a licensed physical education teacher, and 30 minutes by a classroom teacher. In Appleton, we split that time into two 15-minute segments that provides activities to get all students vigorously active. Not all of our teachers make their fit and 15 time a priority because of the pressure of academic scores, or they really don't realize the importance of getting their kids active. 
Our physical education teacher from Jefferson Elementary took the data from the classrooms that regularly participate in Fit and 15 and charted their standardized aerobic test capacity, or PACER, against their literacy and math scores. Students who met or exceeded the healthy fit zone requirements scored an average of 13 points higher in their measure of academic performance, math assessment, and an average of 11 points higher on their map literacy assessment than students who did not reach the healthy fit zones. This data led to changes to make sure students were getting more activity time during the day. Many of our schools experience a lot of disruptive behaviors. Our district developed wellness rooms that are used to connect to our community. We wanted to see if using these rooms would help students with physical aggression better control their behavior. Edison Elementary conducted a before school program using the wellness room. They identified 17 students with physical aggression and had them be a part of the before school program every day. They tracked the students for four months. The students were seven times less likely to get an office discipline referral for physical aggression. The same students also scored eight points higher on the required state testing. Not all of our schools have this type of room, but we are able to develop rooms that create the same outcomes. Many of our schools offer before and after school opportunities for students, including intramural sports, walk run clubs, biking clubs, ski clubs, etc. These activities provide a way for our students to connect to schools other than academics, and many of the results of the same desirable behavior outcomes as the wellness rooms. Our school sponsors many activities connect with our families. In the fall, our elementary schools collaborate to sponsor the Tough Kid Challenge. It's fashioned after the Tough Mudder Obstacle Course Challenge, and parents are encouraged to participate with their kids. We also connect with our community groups, such as the Way to the Valley, to help support Family Dinner Night, where we bring in nutritionists and teach families the importance of creating healthy meals and eating together. School wellness policies are a valuable tool to inform and guide change for our school districts. The recent changes requiring an audit reporting tool moved our district forward. Our district chose the CDC School Health Index as its reporting tool. We chose this tool because it is used to recognize schools for the Wisconsin Health Award. 12 of our schools have won gold status. Completing the, the school health index creates an atmosphere of cooperation and collaboration, and sometimes friendly competition among staff and administrators. It also allows our schools a way to get extra funds to run successful programs we have been talking about, and also gives each school benchmarks to help them evaluate areas for improvement within their own school. Schools today feel overwhelmed by the feeling of having more added to their plate. All schools want students who are healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. As someone who works in the schools and helps administrators to make connections on how to improve students' health outcomes, I feel that the whole school child model explains how the health of a child is connected to learning outcomes and supports the work of the whole school district. This model forms the basis for developing training and working with agencies, as well as for understanding change that impacts both academics and health outcomes. It should be required to be a part of every continuous school improvement plan. Finally, people talk about school champions as people who will spirit change. Well, our Health and Human Performance Department leads the health changes I presented. In Appleton, we are truly a team of administrators, teachers, support personnel, and families. Likewise, the funding and training support we get from the CDC and our State Department of Instruction allows us to create change we hope for. On behalf of a school district that has used the CDC research and tools extensively, we express our thanks for this work and thank you for developing tools that we can use to make a difference in the community. Thank you. Thank you to everyone presenting. We're going to open it up for the questions and answers. And we have a number of folks who are watching out in the world. Um, Susan, do we want to start from questions there? Thank you. Let me remind our uh, viewers to send your questions to grandrounds at cdc.gov or post to the Facebook feed that you may be watching. Uh, from Mary Jo, are you keeping data on children's growth charts showing that all these efforts and programs are working? Great, I'll go ahead and take that. Um, so the CDC growth charts are uh, used often by healthcare professionals uh, in, in their offices and other kind of settings. We do use a number of tracking and surveillance systems to uh, assess how we're doing as a nation, how we're doing at the state level, and for example, is the data that Krista showed how, for example, low-income population is doing. Um, we do also try to support um, innovative uh, obesity uh, tracking, so we know there are new technologies around electronic health records where uh, more local level data is being collected uh, to use it not only for surveillance, but in places to look at it as an evaluation tool. What strategies are in place to implement healthier standards in out-of-school time settings that have been successful at state levels? This from Robert with the American Heart Association. Thanks. Um, 
So I think we're still learning to look from evaluations to really determine which have been so much successful because I think it's a newer area that there's been a lot of recent growth in. But we know that as of um, 2011, because there really weren't many consistent standards, so kind of outside of the um, meals programs available for out-of-school time, standards were kind of ad hoc. And so in 2011, the National After School Association, working together with a lot of researchers in a broader coalition, released a series of physical activity and nutrition standards to try to help create a vision for what a health year at a school time setting could look like. And those have been adopted by um, several organizations, including National Parks and Rec, the YMCA, Boys and Girls Club. And so I think there's evaluations that have been coming out to look at exactly that question. Um, I think to date, a lot of the studies have been smaller looking at single clubs, but it's an area that I think we definitely expect to learn a lot more from as we see larger evaluations coming through. And just to add to that, the prevention research centers that are funded by our chronic disease center also um, worked with the Harvard Prevention Research Center, and they have an evidence-based intervention called OSNAP that's available online, which again is the out-of-school yeah. time nutrition and physical activity intervention. So it's available for others to take a look at. Uh, we have microphones at the two areas within the room, if there are questions from within. Okay, Susan. We'll keep going with our online audience. Uh, Jessica from the New York State Department of Health. While training daycare staff, I'm often asked how to get teachers to buy into healthy habits and modeling them for children. Center directors and staff who come to training report trying to change the environment for the better, but often run into barriers with teachers, cooks, and other staff who may have direct contact with the children enrolled. Any suggestions? Uh, the first is that uh, acknowledge that it takes time. Um, the first step is getting that groundswell of support and just continuing to expose them to the habits and resources uh, that they need to make that change. A lot of times the staff themselves in those centers have the behaviors that we're telling them aren't good. So of course the phrasing of our approach with those providers needs to be sensitive to the fact that they are likely engaging in habits that we are asking them to change on behalf of the children. That being said, we've heard through focus groups we've done with childcare providers, including one that we did in New York State, that oftentimes the framing of these are the habits that children need to grow up healthy is, an, is a great way to enter. And then also when you explore the, the physiological benefits to children by changing those habits, what we've, what we've heard is that they will in fact change their own behavior in front of children because they see themselves as critical models. Um, there's something about caregivers that they are so motivated to do well for other people that if you explain the good it's going to do for the children, eventually that will get them to buy in at least as long, uh, long enough to, to, to show a different behavior in front of the children. It may not spread. So, um, um, what I would recommend is keep up the good work. Look at the way you're framing the messages that you're exploring with providers. We have um, messaging guidelines and tips for successful messaging on our website and American Heart Association Voices for Healthy Kids and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation have all done extensive messaging research to figure out how you can phrase it the best way so that people can hear you instead of putting those defenses up. We have a question in the back of the room. Oh, we have I, actually, just to follow up on that as well, too, uh, in our district, we know that the health of our teachers directly impacts the academic outcome of our students. But more importantly than that, the health of our teachers are very important. So as making sure that in Appleton, when we talk about it, is like the health of our teachers is just as important as the health of our students. So we want to make sure that we increase their capacity because people teach health out of what they know, right? If I want to give comfort food, it's the comfort I receive from that. So it's something that we want to make sure that we increase their capacity, and that's actually where we've seen the largest growth in teachers and people who want to make sure that happens in our classrooms. So focus on staff wellness, which is actually a key model of the whole school child model, and there's indicators and things there that you can also find resources on. Hi, Jennifer Nelson, Nutrition Branch, DNPAO. This is a question for Mickey. When a child is um, sent to the wellness room, um, how is that structured? Do you just let them choose the option of the equipment they use? Is there an instructor there to kind of help them gauge what to do or ha what, it, what it happens? Well, we really want to teach kids self-regulation skills. Just like yourself, you've actually all have been sitting here way too long. So if you were going to <laughs> self-regulate, really, to be Let's honest. Let's all stand up. Everybody can spit. <laughs> right? Here, it's true, here. really. That is actually true. <laughs> when I, and I realize that you've been standing that long. Your brains aren't engaged. So it's really about even teaching or allowing adults to say, this is how you self-regulate. You can't sit that long. It's not possible. Nothing's going in. 
So we want to teach that we start teaching kids skill. How do you know what self-regulation is? How is your brain today? How is your emotional brain? Did you eat today? Did you get enough sleep today? And so what does that mean? And then that's where we build it into what's called active classrooms. Is there something here in this classroom you need to get up, go do, get a drink? do a quick activity break, or do you need something more to self-regulate the vigorous physical activity, and then that's where we help do it. And we also do work collaboratively very well with our social workers and things like that, where we help identify kids to say, do you need this beforehand? And we, that's where we also see kids start engaging more with our communities because they're involved in our intramural programs and things like that. So really, it's not that we want to take it, but we want to make sure that we're educating our students to make sure that they understand what that self-regulation is. We don't want to make sure we want to make sure that the students don't have it done to them, but make sure that they're a part of the process. So we want it to be a choice, and then we do use it as a, as a way to help them as well with their aggression. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Becky Bunnell from CGH. Thank you so much. That was a, a great panel. I was just wondering if all of you or any of you could reflect a little bit more on what you see as the most uh, strategic, high priority scientific gaps going forward. Where, where should CDC and other partners be focusing our efforts to further build out the evidence base that you described? I think for just as a school perspective, there, there's so much rich data out there I think just helping schools to just dive in and believe it and act on some of those things, but it's hard when you're talking about some of the, you know, like if you know anybody in education, let's say how many behaviors are you dealing with or you have no idea the test scores that we're trying to get to or how do we get to with their academic. So I think if we, again, to me, like I said in my presentation, I really believe in the whole school whole child model. So I think if we can connect there and give people resources, people want to do what's right. So if there's a way for them to understand how to do it, and make sure that we're giving them functional tools within that that's easy for them to find and a way to connect them and how does they can maybe see examples. Because nobody's ever going to arrive, that's health, right? So how do we keep moving forward? So I think if, as a nation, if we can collaboratively work on that, I think that that would be one way to help. Um, I think one area we have um, a lot to learn from is more from the vein of implement implementation science because I think we have a pretty good sense of what the strategies are, what behaviors we like to see happening in schools more often, but we know that the how you get there is going to look really different depending on different contexts. So I think trying to get a better understanding of what's working well for whom under what conditions would really be what's needed to kind of drive um, schools forward to being better able to implement these kinds of multi-component strategies that the evidence is pretty strong for. I'm very much focused on health disparities in my work, particularly around the settings. Um, as I mentioned before, the childcare settings are so varied. Um, I would love to know more about racial and ethnic data around implementation of specific strategies based on the location of service and the type of um, and the type of provider involved. I think once we get a handle on that, I think we'll know a lot better about what we can do for both regulated care settings as well as unregulated care settings, because uh, we need to make sure that we close health disparities for everyone, and there are many children uh, in our target groups that are not in formal care settings or that are in one formalized care setting more so than the other. So I think it'll help us decide our strategy for implementation. Um, I just have three um, off the top here. One is really looking at optimal infant nutrition, so really understanding the birth to two years. Really, um, we have a, a paucity of data in that area, understanding uh, parents, caregivers, the child care providers, how we can really optimize the birth to two years, because we're seeing a lot of early infant weight gain. Um, we see a lot of um, behaviors that we really need to um, enhance, you know, parenting practices as well as other um, uh, education as we learn more about that science. Um, the second is around food security and housing stability. Um, a lot of the, the research that we're out there in the field looking at, um, folks try to take an evidence-based intervention without understanding the context. And so really understanding what those families are struggling with, um, you know, if, if it has to, um, um, I think we really need to embrace understanding how social determinants are impacting these areas. Um, and then the, the third is what, what Sarah said, which is really process and implementation science. So NAPSAC, for example, is a great intervention that we know is evidence-based, leads to change in BMI in young children. Um, but we really probably don't have a good set of fidelity measures to really um, start to really adapt that in some other locations. Um, we were able to do that through uh, some of the funding in CTG and CPPW, where we really saw more er 
uh, rural areas using knapsack, more tribal areas, um, but we really didn't have the rigorous evaluation to make sure that we're really seeing the similarity and effectiveness that we saw with, with the parent uh, interventions. Okay, back of the room. Okay. Uh, Brent Wolf, Global Immunization Division. Um, just to build on Becky's question, research, this is research into practice. Um, just when we moved uh, into Atlanta to take the job here and put our kids in Decatur schools, uh, we were told that they'd canceled resets at, at, uh, at the Decatur public schools because they needed more time to study for Georgia milestones. Uh, second part of the preface to this question is that I work in the global immunization space we're trying to work and use schools as a platform to get kids immunized. And one of the barriers that we face is that the education departments tend to be very separate from the health departments, and it's very difficult to get discussion across the two platforms. Leading to my question, I hear some advocacy tools that came across here, but how successful and what strategies are we are, have proven most effective to actually get these recommendations into the education side of it so they can build it into school policy to do these sort of things. Thank you. I, I think just hearing something like this, I mean, you, you yourself, I can hear it in your voice, the desperateness of like, you know, that they're canceling recess and so that means that you're seeing some of the outcomes that are coming from that. So I think it's just making sure that you as a voice, as a community voice, that's really important, and being an advocate for that is very important, like why it's out there. And then data, data, data. I mean, I think a lot of the stuff that's coming out with the neuroscience, what I talked about, the rainbow brain, there's a lot of information out there that will help get buy-in, because every parent wants to make sure that they're helping their, their kid to make sure that they're better emotionally regulated, that they have better physical activity, um, and I think the outcomes. As far as what gets it into schools, when I talk to schools, uh, besides my own district, it's just that there is a strong academic connection. I can automatically tell you that the, what the academic output will be, behaviors, uh, math and science, reading, and those type of things that are connected to that. So I think it's just helping them to do that. And then, really, it just takes a champion, a teacher, to try to do that, and they start seeing a difference and then they want to know what that data was and if they can just state how that data was, even if it's anecdotal, it'll make a difference. And then that's what appeals to your boards because they need to make sure that they're seeing the difference academically. And let's quickly add to Mickey's comment about data. There's been a lot of research looking at, you know, what happens when if you increase time spent on physical activity in a school day. And there really aren't any studies that show that if you increase the time spent to that, you're going to miss out in terms of academic outcomes. So there's lots of studies showing benefits there's some studies showing neutral effects, but there really isn't anything showing that you do have a loss. And so I think that evidence is, is, can be fairly compelling. And I think also don't underestimate your ability um, to be, uh, you know, cause good trouble as a parent. Um, you know, there are school wellness committees and parents can be active members of those. And similar to your question about immunizations, um, people from the health department can be a part of a wellness committee. Or you can find out when are wellness committees meeting and can you show up because you, as a part of the general community, they can't say no. You, you are allowed to attend. So um, I think just being aware that those opportunities exist and taking advantage of them is something you can consider. We're going to take the last question from online. Susan? It seems like many states are looking at awards and recognition programs both in, in both ECE and school settings. Have they been shown to be effective and worth the time and effort it takes to implement them? Um, I can say that in the early care and education, um, the results are mixed. I think it often depends on um, the amount of funding they have essentially for technical assistance and supports and the amount of publicity that the recognition program itself gets. The more, the more you're able to connect resource and referral, which are the connections for parents to child care, um, to those recognition programs and highlight it, which our, which our partners in San Diego County um, have done, the better chances of success. And they've had really great success in other states or in other localities where um, the recognition program is set up, but there aren't, uh, you know, there's maybe one or two people working on the project. Um, there isn't a lot of training or technical assistance that it's provided with um, the recognition program. The results um, aren't nearly as successful. So um, it is a good strategy when it is well-funded um, and, and, again, when those training and technical assistance supports are provided to child care providers and center directors. 
Oh, I'd like to, again, uh, thank our, our panel and uh, all of their colleagues for this important work. Uh, let's have another hand for them. And please join us again next month for Public Health Grand Rounds. Thank you.